introduce our just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, firstly, copies of the poet's book to support their work in whatever way you can, uh, whether that means following them online, buying books, saying nice things to them while you're here. Being here is also a great offer on silent uh, for the readings, and thank you for being respectful of our poets. Uh, please also know that the event is being live streamed from their, the uh, iPad behind the column right here. Hello, YouTube. Um, the audience will uh, And finally, we will have a Q&A at the end. What could he do? Bob slipped off like the carrots on his wife's plated <clears throat> spoon, which never could hold much in place. I had to salvage scavenged bits of nature, which Bob would have given second life. And to the cruelty-free shrine beside the knitted hats that just might keep us all a bit warmer listening hard for the right prayer to lift into the atmosphere while the living and the dead watch ants sprinkle the sidewalks and bridges build hallways in the sky. And I'm going to end with a poem called Weather Report. And I want to thank you all again for being here. You're all beautiful from this angle. <laughs> Weather Report. Soon, April. And those of us who've frozen our fingers closed, pinning children's outfits into brightly colored popsicles, or who'd shovel dirty snow just before the town's plow, pushed the icy streets onto our driveways, or who'd spilled the golden retriever's ashes we'd agreed none of us would scatter until spring when all of us could gather. Blink away, lopsided snowmen blinded by hungry deer. We notice as the neighbors drag away electric doors who've shone our, through our windows for so long that our rescue puppy no, no longer interrogates them. We cannot help but recall our parents' tree, its poison tinsel, or the year she <clears throat> swallowed it while lodged with litter. Or was that the year she widened but didn't whelp? The year she'd collected and mothered the ornaments, the year she would not let any of us near the torn rabbit. Anyway, their deer had stood since before the couple left to have their daughter and long after the morning they returned without her. But let's not fret about Christmas decorations from our past or those strewn on our neighbor's lawn. Mud season arrives despite the stillborn the earth rolling over as expected. If we live long enough, we pause when the ground softens, the wood pile dampens, while the sparrow song is close enough to touch. Thank you. here at Brookline Booksmith for supporting poets and poetry and Deborah for getting us all together and I have to say how thrilled I am to be reading with these three wonderful women who have touched my own poetry so deeply and also <coughs> do so much work to uplift poets in the community all while they have full-time jobs so it is an honor to read alongside you. Um, I'm going to be reading a few poems from my new debut book, <laughs> Dot Girl, which is about my life growing up in Dorchester in the 70s and uh, 80s. Uh, I divided up into sections on complex post-traumatic stress disorder <laughs> and <laughs> in attempts to use my personal life story as an extended metaphor. I believe that trauma lives, unprocessed trauma, lives in our bodies. But it doesn't just live in individuals' bodies, it lives in families, intergenerationally, it lives in streets, it lives in neighborhoods, towns, cities, states, countries, and in our institutions. And by we unsilencing ourselves, and calling things by their true names is an important step in recovery, resilience, personal, and I hope, societal change. 
This first one is called Where the Water Meets the Sky. It used to be called Timmy Ann Beach. I thought Where the Water Meets the Sky sounds so much more poetic. We move in fog, in reek of fish, sneaking out screenless windows at night, climbing down garage roofs or window tapping trees. In slick, shiny streets, under the faint blue light, we dance in silence to the beach. The bosses and their workers snore through the perfect time. We scream our names like angry owls under the bridge by the beach. Your brother slept here, where the tunnel curves by the road. One night he saw us. He was singing the Rolling Stones. Knees winked from the holes in his filthy white pants. Cars lit, cars, car lights flashed him a spotlight of shame. We pretended not to hear him say, get out of here. The sand is sharp, but we go barefoot. Tiny pieces of glass prick our feet, reminding us of the pain we haven't felt. The air is foul and alive as we strip down under each other's star-like eyes. The two of us back float, white stick bodies and bruised and murky water, only hands touching. We breathe out the memories of the day, stare at celestial light born before we were. You claim there's a spot where the water meets the sky, where souls swim free and no one calls them home. In the morning, we sneak back to our parents and remind them to take us to school. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. I'm going to introduce you to one of my brothers. My brother thought it funny to call his friends before carousing and have me sing into the phone. You lush, you lush, you lush, you lush. Oh, they called him Spook, because when he raced, he'd be dead last until the end, then glide past everyone to gold. Sing it, Lynn. Sing the stones. I'm shattered. I'm in tatters. He'd slap on his brute, saunter out into the street. I knew the time was coming. God warned me. My nimble eyes scan out the front door, seeking that first flake of snow that I just know will get school canceled, or the vampire I'll get to kill with my blue plastic cross. I'm on the lookout. I'm the family watchman. Green dark hugs the street with her wet breath. Street lights are UFOs halos or shields. His eyes emerge from the night, two shades of blue, two knives of gray. They fly like birds out his body onto our front porch. My brother's face unfamiliar, his nose is pressed against the glass, against mine pressed on the other side. They're coming, Lynn, let me in. But my parents have told me to keep the door locked. My brother's monsters are invisible, but we both know they are there. He's locked out, I'm locked in, and I know that it's true. There's a monster in me too. And in the street and in our house, I'm a demon, I'm an angel, I'm a future virgin mother in white. I have visions and I know it before it happens. My brother's hand breaks the glass in slow motion. We're shattered on the hall in the 70s linoleum. Pieces of us float forever in a story he won't recall and I never get right. 
Shards of gold, splinters of green, cling to my nightgown. Blood washes my toes, his arm hamburger, the deepest cut I ever saw, yet my face still whole as a miracle. And now, for some fun <laughs> with my Uncle Hugh. I remember the day my father punched your face in. We kids were all watching over the banister. We laughed. The story went you came without calling to catch dad at his worst. You loved seeing him that way. You pretended that you came to see us because it was Christmas and you had presents. I wonder what they were. Imagined the crisp wrapping paper in bows. Just for a moment, I hoped you would win. Take the 10 of us out into the night. Somehow we'd all fit in the back of your big black car. Oh, it would smell like Aunt Mary's wind song. We'd drive off into the night, swim in your pool. I can picture your hair shiny with vitalis, a cleaner version of my father. You wore a tie for nothing. You didn't know how to, you didn't drink screwdrivers and your kids didn't know how to make them. Your wife thought she was pretty in her makeup and her fancy clothes. Oh, how we love to make fun of the two of you. We loved it the day dad punched your face in. Really, we did. We loved that we never had to see you see us again. How did it happen that you had a car? That your kids were clean and had nice clothes? How exactly was it that you wore a black suit and shiny shoes while my dad in bare feet and underwear strained to knock your teeth out onto our kitchen floor? And finally, my mother. But I like to think of this as all of the mothers of Dorchester at this time. It is called the Mothers of Dorchester Bay. And we shall have a new Bible, and the holy name shall be woman. The colleges shall be made free. The classrooms will burst open onto Morrissey Boulevard, and the streets and the monuments shall be renamed. Research shall resume there where our mother's names were removed. Their dreams once tread upon shall be made new and gleaming, snapping like sheets in the wind, strung tight between the triple-deckers. They shall go no more to priests who devour their sons for being so sweet. No more shall we be divided into parishes and projects. Oh, my holy mother saint, Joan McDade, shall be resurrected and redeemed. Oh, yes, the mothers of Dorchester Bay shall float and rise like new Jesus. And all of Boston shall know their stories. And they shall live forever. Bodies unblemished, eyes unblackened. Thank you. so much for creating this amazing space. It's fantastic that you do this um, every month. And of course, Deborah Lipsire, thank you for bringing us together. And um, you need a sense of community. You need people that are like-minded around you so that you can thrive because we can't do it alone. So keep that in mind. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm reading from my book. Uh, Comorant on the Strand, which has Montgomery Cliff on the cover. If you guys know who he is, I don't expect a lot of people who are under you know, my age to know who he is. But he was a great um, film star, really beautiful actor, and um, closeted gay um, 
addicted to a lot of different things, but brilliant guy. Anyway, so <clears throat> I'm gonna read a childhood poem too. Um, my mom is a single mom and we were always moving and we went to this one school that had no walls. And I could see my brothers like totally passed out on their desks, like <laughs> this is so distracting. But um, it was a progressive school at that time. You could study anything you wanted to. <laughs> so I didn't study math. <laughs> it's called Swiss School Song. Fourth grade in the back of the school in the fallen woods, a Swiss school without walls. I see my brother asleep at their desk. Sunlight through the apple leaves, a happiness playing on my face through branches, in and out the shadow and light. Songs pour out of me into the trees. Below, boys on dirt bikes race and die, gray-green weeds bent and dry, light dust over my Levi's. And return to the class without walls, with empty folders. <clears throat> So um, we, we were always moving, but uh, my mom had the, had the intelligence to put us in this uh, place called CYO camp, which was a Catholic camp, and it was really cheap. And it was, it was great, but you know, you're left to, totally to your own devices for the most part. Um, and this is called, uh, there's a, there's a, have you guys ever seen those spider bugs that stay on the creek? and they jump. So this is called Spatterdock Song. <clears throat> and this is the epitaph in the front. From 1822 to 1883, Francis Buchanan White collected several species during the Challenger expedition. Water spiders, water striders, water bugs, pond skaters, and water skippers, or Jesus bugs, belong to the class of true bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Near the small brown creek, water spiders jump from yellow water lilies. Their song's impossible to hear, except for the slumbering bottom fish beneath that interpret within dreams of mud and rust, moving to a slow rhythm current out of pipes. Whiskered and black, swimming beneath the quick, impermanent, large-eyed diving bell, silver spider, jumping from one leaf to another. By the edge of the water I follow your journey, silent wish, even through the culverts, eventually leaving, walking back up to the cottage camp for girls, without windows, doors, or gates, dreaming of the buddy system in Port Huron and the shoreline, water spiders jumping on the lily pads, creek, dirt, fern, with Camille in the tunnels that go between the creeks, the sea glass glitters in the sand, brown, green, white, and sometimes blue. The rocks are mothers crying for their lost sons, their hair fallen on the waves. And um, I think I should probably uh, <clears throat> read um, from, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm fascinated uh, with the Irish sports pages, if you guys know what those are. And for the people that don't, it's the obituaries. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I found this one, and I just love it. And it's from 1916. 1916, James Flewelling shoots his friend by the explosion of a gun. And this is the italics that I took word for word from the obit. Word was received that James Flewelling of St. Martin's died when his friend fired at a woodpecker with a breech loading gun while in search of a lost cow. <laughs> Can't make this up, you know, it's just pure poetry. <laughs> the futility of two men sitting on a log. Perhaps the light was fading, fireflies were coming up and crickets starting in milkweed. Gnats rose from the rotting log. They were smoking, and good enough friends were the one to take the other's rifle and shoot at the small bird right above their head. Was it frivolous or a joke? 
Was it impetuous cocksure bloodlust to fire at the rod crown of a bird? His small striped body white and black and his fine beak must have lured James into movement. Instead it all backfired. The explosion smashing his childhood friend's skull, injuring his own twisted face, wildly missing the immortal bird who flew away to another branch in the deep pine. Flewellen, the very name is like a bird who flies and never dies, but repeats his mistakes, a bell in sometimes spring where hidden violets lie under moss and myrtle. So, <clears throat> um, so I just read uh, two more, I think, from um, the Monty section of this. And Monty's always been my inspiration, I think, my whole life, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so I took a lot of these uh, lines from his uh, movies, Monty and Bessie in Heaven. <clears throat> Tell me, Monty, what did you do on Earth? I spent it lounging in a fog of dreams, waiting on a movie set, looking at suffering. Well, I spent my time in the garden with my children. And oh yeah, I spent my time with my five husbands. But in the end, it was the peonies, their bowed pink heads dropping with rain under the rose of Sharon. Okay, okay, forget it, Bess. Your mother, do you ever think about your mother? No but I think about my grandmother in her garden, gardening gloves, musty smell of metal in the garage, a smell so seductive that I get lost in trance. Her side garden comprised of purple iris, lamb's ear, silver sage, cat mint, and Russian sage. Along the red brick wall, she painted petunias. In the early evening, I could smell their light, sticky, sweet fragrance lifting me. I was 17, I could have done anything. She wore these soft gray leather gloves from gardening. Why did we do it? What? Why did we live in the screen so others could see us, Monty? No, because in the end, I was living with Lorenzo, playing a broken down cowboy longing for his mother. Oh yeah, the mouse trap. Oh no, Chekhov died from walking in thin soled shoes in the dead of winter tutoring children. I mean, that's what he died of eventually. Let it go, Bess. You'll be my pickup. It seems like we spend the best time, part of our time saying goodbye. If only I could tell you how much I love you. Tell mama. Tell mama all. <laughs> so that's Liz Taylor and Monty talking. <laughs> um, Okay, and the last poem that I'm gonna read is um, one of Monty's, uh, I think, worst films with Olivia de Havilland. But that was after his accident. And uh, he calls his brother, right? Remnants of my property. Hey, old man, hi. I didn't know then that he was recording our conversations. Every day I called my brother until the last picture, Freud, I really should have won that Academy Award for that picture. My brother worked for the CIA, a kind of record keeper. My lines in the heiress spell it out. I'm not a mercenary. After the accident, I had to do things, navigate things differently, use my face in ways I never realized. I could, my hands, my walk, as if some wild thing caught hold of me from the inside. I could not let anyone see what I knew about my body. I'm not a mercenary. In suddenly last summer, I come to heal Catherine in the aftermath of St. Sebastian. Poet, lover, destroyer, fraud. Instead, I become him. Some horrible things were said on that set. Catherine Hepburn spit in the director's face. She did that for me. <laughs> Can you imagine being beneath contempt? I remember it well, being beneath contempt. I am not a mercenary. I have remnants of my property. <laughs> Hello. It's got really uh, 
large since I sat down. <laughs> nice to see all of you. I have a lot of students here too. Wow, that's that really gets me. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Bonnie, for putting this all together. And thank you, Deborah, for being the catalyst to all of this. So, so because my students are here, I think I'm going to read a poem about the teacher that saved my life. And her name was Michaela Schaefer, and she died in uh, 2020, and I didn't get to go to her funeral. So it's called Mother to Remember. Your yurt site will arrive on the 20th of Av, 5780. Dog day, August, eighth month, 10th day. The magus twirling the Yitzker flame into silver tracks. I haven't been back to Brooklyn since, before we knew the pandemic would take us all under. That didn't kill, you fell on the emerald carpet staircase, hemorrhagic stroke. Husband, housekeeper, doctor, neighbor, call 911. Sirens rushed to Maimonides, you never woke up. By the third day, it was decided. They came in pairs and said goodbye. I wasn't there. Join the funeral by Zoom, reduced to the broken, angry girl whose life you saved in 11th grade. I didn't get to say goodbye. No photograph remains. I saved your letters. Spider penmanship and blood maroon ink. You were my favorite teacher who lived in my favorite house on my favorite street. The subway stops recede on the BMT tracks. The silver train pulls out of the station. This is no longer home. All is memory and distance. All is love and love and love. I miss her deeply. Oh, since we started on the theme with the dead, I guess we're just gonna keep it running. <laughs> so this is a poem for um, the poet, the Polish poet, Wisława Symborska. And the name of the poem is, I wish Wisława Symborska could edit my poems. <laughs> we would meet in the space between terror and delay, in a room lined with books and drink tea from bone china cups. She would pour over my lines with the eye of a phoenix and translate my meager imaginings into the mother tongue I cannot yet speak. I would not answer in my diminishing Russian vocabulary parting the lace curtains and levitating towards the east. I am moving backwards with every book I read, and she is there, solitary figure at the desk, cigarette smoke curling above her head, waiting in the corridor reserved only for the dead. And, um, and I have a, a favorite Russian uh, female poet. And all my favorite Russian writers were born in the Ukraine. So Anna Akhmatova was born in the Ukraine, and um, Mikhail uh, Bulgakov was also born in the Ukraine. So this is called Akhmatova in Paris with Modigliani. <laughs> you had emigre status, a hole through the fence where the avenue circled around the river Spring bloomed in eternal resurrection. The cold, the war, the dead, the silver error left behind for just a short time. You were courted by artists, you lovely tall girl. Your crow black hair, he painted it blue in the portrait, blue in his hands, blue in the bed, where everyone could be forgotten where death was as close as breathing in the Paris spring through the window, where you had tossed your blue silk stockings on the chair, 
You chose not to remain. The motherland was calling. The blood and souls would need your words. You left. A hole in the fence repaired with iron. And you never looked back. Oh, and since we have, uh, well, this will all make sense. So this, <laughs> this next poem is called, In My Church, Mary Wears Red. So I was brought up, I was uh, baptized in the Russian Orthodox Church, so all the iconography, Mary's wearing red, you know, in the Catholic Church, she's wearing blue. But when I was a little girl, she wore red and all these gems. And so um, when uh, Vladimir Putin decided it was a good idea to uh, go into the Ukraine, that was two years ago and my husband had just passed away. And then there was the war. And I, I stayed up every night, you know, to watch the news. And this um, uh, epigram comes from a, a piece in the New York Times, and then the poem. So uh, the epigram says, the Moscow patriarch has repeatedly bestowed blessings on the Russian military, giving a historical golden icon of the Virgin Mary to a senior commander, for example and casting the war as a holy struggle to protect Russia from what he called Western scourges like gay pride parades. He has been a vocal supporter of President Vladimir V. Putin, while the church receiving vast financial resources in return. And the writer was Neil Mark and the Quarquart and Sofia Kishovsky, and that was April 2022. And that April, there was Ramadan, there was Passover, there was Western Easter, and there was Orthodox Easter, and it was all happening the same month. So here's the poem. Let's take her out of the picture, out of the historical golden frame where she wouldn't stand for being in the pocket of a general scourge the cold eastern flame of the West. She sees the exchange of gold and gems, what those who do not have eternal life see fit to deal with. Let's take her out of this picture. She's left on the train to the sea. She's standing in the graves found in Bucha. She's wandering in the steel plant in Mariupol this Holy Week, this Passover feast, this month of fasting. She's covering her hair, her face. She's opening her hands and reading the central list of the dead. She's stepping into the Chornaya Mora, swimming mermaid-like, her red garments trailing the fishes and every broken mother's wishes to pull the dead sailors to shores in militias, to show, to show their weeping mothers, their blinded criminal country, the cost of lies, the cost of lives. And she rises <laughs> Venus-like from the sea, Stella Maris Theotokos, mother of Jesus, announcing the resurrection in this, the cruelest month of the year. And I'll just read a few poems from my husband who died in, he died on January 2nd of 2022 and he had done six months of home hospice care. So here's a few of these chess. There is no playbook for the dead, the dying, the caretakers, the family. Hospice provides a map. Drugs arrived, delivered right to the front door. Nurses, chaplains, social workers, volunteers, contraptions, beds that breathe throughout the day and night. Oxygen that becomes a lullaby sheets of paper to keep score, 
morphine four, patient zero, Haldol five, patient zero. Syringes filled to the correct line, gently insert in the inside of his cheek. That didn't hurt until the end. We play chess. The set that arrived from Istanbul. I always play for Salah Hadim, you for Richard and his Templars. I walk you through every move. I let you win. And then the knights, the pawns, the queens, the rooks, the imams and bishops, the king and sultan get put away. I have not opened them since that day. It hurts to see them in their splendor. Hush puppy. I stop taking notes when hospice arrives and the notebook in my purse becomes a scratch pad for shopping lists. For restaurant menus, shaken seafood does not have fried okra. No matter how many times I ask, no red beans. No, we are not in Texas, but they do have a fried catfish basket with French fries, onion rings, and hush puppies. The dog under the bed listens to the undulating sound of the mattress. Your weight shifts in the night of disturbed sleep. In the beginning, there is only the TV, and I turn it off once you are sound asleep. Hush. We had a fabulous dog at that time. Amazing doggy. Um, the name of this poem is Dog in Bed. In death, your death was easier in winter. The dog still alive, my constant companion, learning to navigate the world with only his right eye. I had to bring myself completely to the table, the one where I hand fed him on the kitchen floor, disguising medications to look and taste like treats. He was brave. A cold January afternoon when you died, he sat next to me, suspended. The pewter silence of the new year pressing in my throat. A hospice nurse came to fill out papers and the funeral director sent two young men. They were late. It was a good day for death and we waited, warped in silence. When they arrived, the dog walked to the fence to guide them in, patiently sitting by the hospital bed as they wrapped you in your sheet, lifted your washed and broken body onto the gurney, the dog watched. They zipped and once again, he led them out to the gate. I turned off the bed. The mattress deflating, the snake-like hissing at its unnatural end. That night, I still slept on the couch. I had forgotten how to use a bed. Just two more. So my husband um, was from Texas and was a cowboy and then many other things. So. <laughs> and a very good singer and a good musician. Into the heart of the dust. I'm finding you in books. Open the dust jacket revealed that God is alive. You were always a searcher, a believer, a deceiver. You took notes to remember what you read. God is love. And heaven is a place where you wait at the gate for Peter the rock. Roll away the stones, the gospels of prosperity, the Pentecostal prairie pageant you were born into, the Texas wilderness, all tumbleweed and rifles, cows and horses, second amendment, the well-guarded militia, the assault rifles you carried as a ranger. 
It fades into the horizontal, the looming highway. North to Amarillo, east to Dallas, south to El Paso, west to New Mexico. I'm going to stand in the marketplace at Clovis and buy a pair of pointy boots. I'm going to scatter the dirt of the earth in the memory of the dead, the maligned, the innocent. I'm going to sing my heart into the heart of the dust, the carefully tended acre of mistrust. And this last one is called El Paso. And, and my husband he was a believer, and he struggled so deeply about what was going to happen when he died. And this poem is about what I would tell him, so here we go. El Paso. I thought perhaps you were here. The house so dark that even the dead could find their way back. How is it that you are gone? I tried to find the portal, the hole in the sky that would open and you would rise from your broken body to touch the gate were those ponies lost in childhood to terrible accidental deaths were whole in grazing, lifting their magnificent heads in weight. And you, a child in a big hat, broken in boots and silver spurs with jingle bobs that sing and rake the pasture, the trail you leave behind only a hole in the sky, the wolf moon beckoning forward, the house silent, the dog finally at rest, the winter, this winter, and you in that Texas pasture, tenderly resting your face in the neck of your first pony, the paint horse from El Paso. Let everything be made holy again. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> I just want to say one thing because I'm looking at my students, and when this book, when I have choices of the cover, I pick the one that's every man. And this is like him and his journey. So. <laughs> Time to invite our four poets up for our Q&A. And it's our audience's time to shine. If you have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I will go ahead and call on you. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for that question. That's great. I think it's um, it's just a way to honor memory and um, the dead. And even if you don't know the person, like Annie, you know, I'm not going to talk for Annie, but she's writing about people that she didn't know um, but read about. And so I think that that's important to to have that. We've lost a lot of ritual in in um, when people die. Not just because of COVID, just in general, it was it's going that way. So I think it's I think it's important. Hi there. Um, I I think of <coughs> I thanks for that question, Heather. I I think of 
the living and the dead as a continuum. Hmm. And that the dead never really leave us as long as one, as long as there are living people who have heard of them through history, but also um, even just if you think of the language, uh, perhaps your grandparents taught you some words that they learned from their grandparents. You learned it from their grandparents. So I think of it like um, Frost's use of the word birthing, right? He didn't use that word in everyday speech, but someone in his ancestry used it. And um, so I think that there are met ideas and thoughts that live beyond us. And I think that's what we tap into as creatives sometimes. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Technology. Um, I, that's a great question, Heather. I think for me, that an image comes to me. So we got a lot of photographs from the Soviet Union when I was a kid from my family. And on the back of them, they would write these, these words in Russian, napamits. And it means to remember, like for remembrance. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what it's about for me. It's all about memory. And in the end, I think that's all we have. So these are people I love and I want to remember them and maybe have somebody else read about them. Um, yes, you can hear me? Okay. I think with poetry we can commit magic. And what I mean by that is we can do a lot of change with it, and we can time travel with it, and we can revisit members of our family and people from our neighborhoods. And there is this Irish concept, or at least I think of it as an Irish concept, that your second death occurs when the last living person speaks your name for the last time. So I purposely raised my mother from the dead in my final poem and heal her as best I can. And somehow that relieves something in me and I feel like almost as if it really happened. So I, I think there's a lot of magic that happens with poetry. And I, I don't know how to say it any better than that. <laughs> Uh, do we have any other questions from our audience? We have time for one or two more if anyone has one. All right, going once, going twice. <laughs> Honestly, invoking magic, such a beautiful note to end this lovely, wonderful reading. Thank you to the four of you for sharing your beautiful work. Everyone, let's give them a more round of applause. <laughs>